welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, I'll be wrapping up the Tour de Romandie and showing you why Fernando Gaviria will be the sprinter to beat at the Giro d'Italia. I'll also look ahead to the Giro d'Italia and the Vuelta Femenina and wrap up all the other racing from last week. This week in the world of racing, we learnt that pro cyclists are fast. Very fast. Here's the bunch travelling at a whopping 110 kilometres per hour on a descent at the Tour de Romandy last week. Howell J1 on Instagram spoke for most of us when he commented, no thanks, I'd poo my pants. We also learnt that Rui Costa has too much power. I've never seen a chain ring come off in a prologue before, but that's exactly what happened to him on day one of the Tour de Romandie. Apparently the wrong chain ring bolts were used or something for the chain ring that he had on. Right, on to the racing and I'll start with the Tour de Romandie and why I think Fernando Gaviria is the man to beat at the sprints in the Giro this year. To show you what I mean, let's head over to the touchscreen. Now this is the sixth and final stage of the Tour de Romandie yesterday. I'm gonna pause it straight away just to highlight where Fernando Gaviria is currently on the wheel of Magnus Court. Uh, at the front, the last lead out rider from Ineos Grenadiers, Navarez. On his wheel, Ethan Hayter, who'd taken a stage win earlier on this week. Now, Gaviria clearly had a plan in his mind. He wants to launch himself into the final right-hand sweeping bend that's about 200 metres to go, hopefully with enough speed to have a gap coming out of the other side. So what he needs to do is wait for Lewis Askey's back wheel to go past his front wheel and hope that he's got clean air to the left of him when that happens so that he can launch. That's exactly what happens. That's where he goes. About 350 metres to go until the finish line. And if I take the magnifying glass off, you will see just how big his gap was through and out the other side of the corner. Good three bike lengths back to Monton of Lotto Desti in second place. Ethan Hayter already way too much distance to make up to get on terms of Gaviria. And so in the end, it looks like an easy and simple win for Gaviria. He has time to look around and post up and accelerate before the finish line. But it was a masterclass in tactical sprinting, in my mind. Now, I tried to look at the Strava files for the top riders on the day. The top six, they're either private accounts or they just didn't upload. But a rider that was also in the top 10 did, and that man is riding for Group Harmer FDJs, Lewis Askey just here. Now through that final corner, Lewis Askey was doing 63.5 kilometers per hour, but he'd actually had to scrub off speed before he came into it. If you keep your eye on him, he gets a shoulder from the left, a shoulder from the right, and he has to actually not brake probably, but certainly not pedal through it. So if you consider the speed that he was going, Gaviria here must have been sprinting out of the saddle through a corner at in excess of 65 kilometers per hour. Possibly even more than that, close to 70. His bike handling skills are absolutely incredible. Now, I timed it from the moment that he went to the finish line, 22 seconds. Gaviria, particularly this season, has had a fantastic long drawn out sprint. And that's something that he tried actually back in March at Terreno Adriatico. A completely different calibre of sprinters were in this race. I've got the European champion Fabio Jakobsen, just on his wheel, glued to it in fact, is Jasper Philipsen, Dylan Grunewagen there and plenty of others as well. And perhaps Fernando Gaviria doesn't fancy his chances in a drag strip race to the line against that calibre of sprinter. So he tries to anticipate. He goes with about 300 metres to go and like the final stage of the Tour of Romandy, he opens up a nice gap very quickly indeed. I pause it at this point, it's probably two, maybe three bike lengths back to Sudal Quickstep lead out rider. Now Gaviria's undoing on this occasion was this man, Jasper Philipsen. He probably senses the danger that Gaviria poses here with the speed that he went. And so he launches his sprint, probably a bit earlier than he was hoping to, gets into the slipstream of Gaviria and he's got enough power and enough speed to get alongside him and pass him, just by the finish line. And you will see just how close this finish is. If I can pause it at just the right moment. No, I can't, but if I wind it back. That's how close Gaviria got to taking his first World Tour stage of the year at Terreno Adriatico. Uh, first, Jasper Philipsen, second, Grunewagen, and a very close third, Fernando Gaviria. Right, the final one I want to show you comes from the Tour of Swan, San Juan, if I can get my words out, back in January. This is Fernando Gaviria all the way down here. Uh, his teammate, his last one, has already done his final piece of work for him, but he's already a long way from the back wheel of eventual winner Sam Wellsford there, and indeed of eventual second place finisher Sam Bennett of Bora Hansgrohe. But keep your eye on Gaviria. 
I pause it here, you'll see he's alongside Peter Sagan. He's got a lot of traffic to navigate his way through. And actually in just a few moments time, he's in clean air. He's using energy and power that we would have much rather saved for later on in this sprint. But he weaves his way through the traffic, he eventually goes to the right hand side of the road. But even then, once he gets there, it's far from plain sailing. He has to brake check twice here. First up there, and then back over to the right here. And even once he gets through, it's still an incredibly narrow gap that he has to navigate his way through. All of this at probably 70 kilometers per hour plus. It's a really long sprint once again. He comes incredibly close to taking the win. Doesn't quite get there. Sam Wellsford takes the win. He's over here. Uh, second place for Sam Bennett, and another third place for Fernando Gaviria. But once again, Wellsford, Bennett, they're not at the Giro d'Italia, and that is why I think Gaviria is going to be the man to beat in the sprints in Italy. It's also his contract year this year. From what I could see, he got a one-year deal at Team Mobistar, so he'll want to rack up the wins at the Giro d'Italia so that his agent can negotiate a new contract sooner rather than later. What do you think? Will Gaviria win multiple stages of the Giro this year, or am I talking complete codswallop? Let me know in the comment section just down below. Uh, the overall classification of the Tour de Romandie was won by UAE's Adam Yates, but he was far from the only standout performer over the six stages. Sudal Quickstep got off to a brilliant start with a win in the prologue for Joseph Cherny and then a sprint win for Ethan Vernon, who'd hung tough on the climbs on stage one. Another Ethan, Hayter, took the spoils on stage two, with Vernon and many of the other sprinters dropped through the pace that had been set by Jumbo Visma throughout the day. And the finale there was the first glimpse we had of Juan Ayuso's form. It was his first race since last year's welter due to injury. And not only was he attacking in the finale, he also finished a close second to Hayter at the finish. And he more than backed that up the following day by winning the individual time trial on stage three. Uh, those two stages also underlined, I think, that he's got no real weakness as a bike rider. Remind you of anybody else? One of his teammates, perhaps? Uh, now, his lack of racing, though, did show on the summit finish to tie on 2000. He was dropped relatively early there, but it was still a great day for UAE Team Emirates. Adam Yates chased down a number of attacks from the likes of Roman Bardet before finally launching his own move off the front. A really strong ride, though, for Matteo Jorgensen kept the gap small for a while, but eventually the elastic snapped and Yates did enough not just for the stage win, but also for the overall win. Thibaut Pino, who I thought looked like he was struggling when the initial selection was made on that mountain, came good at the finish for a strong second place, whilst fellow Giro d'Italia participant Damiano Caruso was third. The most notable performances, though, were a little further back. Max Poole and Kian Outybrooks, who both recently celebrated their 20th birthdays, finished fourth and sixth respectively, whilst Egan Bernal showed some of his best form since that crash at the start of last year, finishing a solid eighth on that stage. Hats off as well to Jorgensen. He's had an incredible season already this year. Winner in Oman overall, top 10 at Paris-Nice and the Tour of Flanders, top three at E3, and now second overall at the Tour de Romandie. That guy is going places in all types of races. Right, on to what we've got coming up for you on GCN Plus this week, and it's all about the Grand Tours. Today sees the start of a brand new Vuelta Femenina that has been extended this year to seven stages. By the time this show is out, the opening team time trial in Toro Vieca will be done and dusted, but stages two and three look to be for the sprinters at the race. Uh, the first of the hilly stages comes on day four into Guadalajara, but the first summit finish comes the day after that into Mirador de Peñas Lanas, 4.6 kilometers at 7.1%. There are then more opportunities for the attackers over the undulating terrain of stage six, but the queen stage comes on the seventh and final day. It finishes, atop Lagos de Covadonga, 13 k's long with an average gradient of just under 7%. And that percentage is a little deceptive because it includes the downhill that leads them to the final kick up to the finish line. Either way, that is where the overall race will be won or lost. And make sure you tune into at least that one on Sunday if you can. Territory restrictions do apply. Uh, many of the sport's biggest names are going to be on the start line today, although unfortunately Elisa longo Borghini was withdrawn last week due to illness. Nevertheless, we have Van Fleurten versus Vollering on the GC, and it's going to be very interesting to see if what we saw in the classics continues on to La Vuelta, with terrain that is more to Van Fleurten's liking. Persico, Sprat, Labus, Lippert, Garcia, Nuvia Doma and Music are amongst the other contenders for the general classification, but I think that Gaia Riolini is going to win. 
That's my prediction. In the absence of Lorena Vibes, Charlotte Cool will be the woman to beat in the sprints, and you'd imagine that her team, Team DSM, will have to shoulder much of the responsibility in keeping the groups together on the flatter stages. And then on Saturday, it's the Giro d'Italia, the race that I know many of you have been waiting for in great anticipation, and you would be right to be excited. I've been looking through all the stages and the riders over the last few days, getting ready for our big GCN preview show, and there are going to be a lot of thrilling days over the course of that three weeks. It's one that we're able to show to all GCN Plus subscribers, live and on demand, because we've got no territory restrictions. So one last call out before the race, if you're not already subscribed to GCN Plus, now would be the best time of year to do so. Not only do we have live coverage of every single stage and every kilometer of the Giro from start to finish, there are also a whole host of other races on this month that you can watch live or on demand. In fact, we've got a total of over 60 days of live racing, and yes, I know that doesn't make sense when there's only 31 days in May, but that's how much racing is on. There's a lot of doubling up. And that doesn't even include the UCI World Series mountain biking that we'll be bringing you for the first time ever later this month. Pauline ferron Prevost and Tom Pidcott will both be racing in the cross-country events in Nova Mesto in the middle of May, where we'll also have the short track and marathon events. Uh, speaking of other types of events, we've also got the PTO Tour European Open this Saturday, May the 6th. Uh, the first event takes place in Ibiza in Spain, and each round consists of a gruelling 2k swim, 80k bike ride, and an intense 18k run to the finish line. We'll have live coverage of each and every round for you on GCN Plus this season. Back to road racing though, and as well as the Vuelta Femenina, you'll also be able to catch the Eschborn Frankfurt one-day race today. Sam Bennett is back to defend his title from last year, but Philipson, De Lee, Christoph Ackerman and Bauhaus are amongst those that are going to be trying to take it themselves. On Saturday, we've then got the men's and women's Grand Prix du Morbihan, and then on Sunday, Trobro Lyon, the infamous race in Brittany which takes in a bunch of farm tracks. Uh, back to the Giro d'Italia though, and as well as our big preview show that will be out later this week, we've also got an exclusive Giro collection of films on GCN+. Uh, you can get to know some of the race's biggest champions, learn more about two of Italy's most iconic bike brands, and later this month you can relive the epic story of American Andy Hampson's 1988 Giro Triumph. That one of course was made famous by his ride over the freezing and snow-covered Gavia Pass. That documentary is going to be available to watch on GCN+, from Tuesday the 16th of May. Uh, thanks incidentally for all your feedback on our Vincenzo Nibali film. Really glad that, that one's gone down so well because the team put an enormous amount of hard work into it. Meanwhile, in the GCN shop, we've just launched our limited edition range to celebrate three weeks of racing around Italy. Uh, it features unique designs paying homage to epic climbs, including this one which features the Stelvio. Uh, it's the first Grand Tour of the season, of course. We've even brought back our popular components t-shirts and pink water bottle. So head over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com if you'd like to get any of them. And just one final plug, this month's GCN Club sock is also dedicated to an epic climb, the Paso Jow. Members should be receiving theirs soon if you haven't done so already. Right, let's move on to the other racing from last week. Uh, Lorenzo Fortunato got a big morale boost ahead of the Giro by winning the Vuelta Asturias in Spain. He won the second of the three stages there and successfully defended his race lead on the final day. Uh, the Movistar pairing of Rubio and Sosa finished on the second and third steps of the podium, while stages one and three were won by Damien Hausen and Paleo Sanchez respectively. Up in Luxembourg, the Ceratizit Festival Elsie Jacobs was won overall by Ali Wollaston. Her win on the second and final stage gave her enough bonus seconds to overhaul Marta Bastianelli by just one second in the overall classification. That was the 22-year-old's first overall stage race win since turning pro. Uh, Wollaston and Bastianelli had been fighting it out at both the intermediate sprints and the finishes over the two-day race this year. At the Mountain Bike French Cup in Guéré, Pauline ferron Prevot won the women, Sam Gaze the men's, and finally, in Belgium, Centre Sentience took victory in the E3 Saxo Classic. In other news, Trek Segafredo have parted ways officially with Antonio Tiberi. The Italian had been temporarily suspended by the team after killing a cat with a shotgun, but in their statement they said that they've mutually agreed to part ways, effective immediately, after the riders' actions during his suspension did not meet their criteria for a return to competition. No idea what his actions were, or weren't. Uh, meanwhile, Nick Schultz has prolonged his contract with Israel Premier Tech, which means he'll remain at the squad until at, the, at least the end of 2025. 
Right, so that is all for this week's GCN Racing News Show, but I'll see you again on Wednesday for the World of Cycling, where I'm going to be joined by Tom Southern and William Fotheringham to talk about their favourite race of the year, the Giro d'Italia. See you then.